on the Zoom for today. Before we be begin, we feel there's really a need to recognize that within this past year, we lost, Buffalo has lost two <laughs> medical giants, two people who were both who so much part of this community and that we're very proud of. And I think you have a slide for them, Jennifer. We'll start with Bob Milch. I think all knew Bobby Milch as a wonderful human being. He made a momentous decision in the middle of a highly successful surgery career to change the direction of his life. And he began to care for those who were dying. And he was instrumental in establishing the first Buffalo hospice as an inpatient procedure here. He also contributed much to that field, including the reality that very, very high doses of analgesics can be given if they're introduced slowly. The second giant who I'm calling a giant is Dr. Jim Nolan. Jim Nolan who many of us knew personally, of course, had an impact on so many people in this Western New York area. He not only was a great professor, teacher, researcher, he became very involved both locally, regionally, and nationally in medical leadership. And he had an enormous impact on many, many people and we remember him very fondly. So I'd like to suggest that we start this program by taking a, a moment, a few moments of silence to remember these two extraordinary faculty members. Thank you. And we will continue to, remember, to carry their memory forward. Well, I will transition to say how proud the, America, the Emeritus Medical Faculty is to be hosting Michael Kane here as he's transitioning in his life. We are both very proud of everything that he has accomplished. At the same time, we're very apprehensive about what's to follow. So we will see that. And I would just start like to say that the Emeritus Medical Faculty is, has recognized throughout the marvels that Dr. Kane has accomplished. Um, first is his role of Dean, which he performed for 15 years. Um, we all know the enormous accomplishments, including a magnificent health center downtown that is the envy of all, that it, he is recruited and been responsible for, for recruiting extraordinary new faculty members that have been highly productive. New programs have emerged. As Vice President of Health Sciences, Dr. Kane made clear his commitment to multidisciplinary education, practice, and research and his commitment to the inner city and all aspects, all elements of our society should be have available medical care. The Medical Emeritus faculty has been recognized and supported by Dean Kane, and we greatly appreciate that. We had initiated the Gold Humanism Honor Society, the Richard Sarkin Emeritus Medical Faculty Gold Humanism Honor Society, and as one of the as one of the early societies in the United States, we have, we have worked closely with Dr. Kane. He's been proud of what has gone on here, and he's an inducted member of the Gold Humanism Honor Society. We are also proud of the Medical Emeritus Conference Room that has been provided to the medical school adjacent to Dr. Kane's office. So we, at this point, we wish Dr. Kane great success as he returns to his ex extraordinary career in research in cardiology, where he has, of course, had a very distinguished um, record there. I could go on and on, and as I've just mentioned to Dr. Kane, I, could, I, I had to limit this somehow, so I am. 
But at this point, we are very eager to hear Dr. Michael Kane reflect on his years here in leadership in Buffalo that has been so extraordinary and a view to what he sees the future of healthcare. So with that, we welcome Dr. Michael Kane, and I don't think we can applaud in person, but individually. <laughs> so thanks, Michael. We're so glad you're with us. So thank you, Len, and again, good afternoon to everyone. The, the Medical Emeritus Faculty Society and our medical alumni broadly have been a major source of, of, of friendship, uh, support, uh, uh, collegiality, and, and advice, and I value uh, all the time that I've been able to spend with, uh, with you and, uh, and again, as I said, our alumni group broadly. Jennifer, if you can put the first slide up, I, I, I can't help but show this one last time. Um, but it's actually becomes more and more meaningful to me um, as I continue to show it and, and fulfill the, the, the mission that I was given today, which is to reflect a little bit and predict the future. This was a slide I made in 2006 to visualize where I saw Buffalo as an outsider and at the same time felt where we could go um, if we pulled together a great group of people who were committed to the school, the university, uh, and the community and in advancing the public health of Western New York. So I saw us as a bunch of, of, of very good isolated medical bands and our goal was to create a medical symphony in the Buffalo version of a, of a, of a true academic health center. And that symphony needed two things to happen. One, we needed a symphony hall uh, to play our music in. Um, and two, we needed to uh, take the best of what was here uh, bring in additional people uh, and work collaboratively together to achieve excellence through collaboration and cooperation and not so much through internal competition. So let me just begin and I, I have a few slides that I'm gonna show at a very, very high level um, that sort of show the progress that has been made and, and, and the good news is there's many areas of where we need additional progress. So as I said, the first component of this was a symphony hall. Uh, and I am very pleased with how we as a community came together and uh, over a relatively short period of time, um, uh, working with uh, several of our hospital partners really created a physical structure on the Buffalo Niagara Medical Campus and beyond, um, that really is second to none as far as the quality of the equipment rooms, educational facilities that we have. So we have our new Jacob School. Uh, uh, we have Conventus as a uh, multidisciplinary outpatient uh, uh, for seeing patients. Uh, we now have a presence in the Research Institute on Addiction, the new Oshai Children's Hospital, modernization of Buffalo General. Behind that is the uh, Clinical Translational Research Center and the Gates Vascular Center, Roswell Park Cancer Institute. And what's not shown on this slide is, you know, to the right, which um, includes the Gateway Building on Goodell and uh, the um, New York a center for excellence in life sciences and, and informatics where uh, we have faculty in addition to faculty that we continue to house in some of the buildings on the South Campus. Next one. So if we start looking at what really has become a four-legged stool um, for traditional academic medicine, let me just begin with research and just show one or two slides here that, that shows that we have moved into the big leagues broadly in um, basic clinical and translational research. And that was the initial awarding uh, in 2015 of the Clinical Translational Science Award and its successful competitive renewal and the creation of the Clinical and Translational Science Institute, which is a massive consortium of many, many different organizations 
in Western New York that are dedicated to advancing research discoveries with a particular focus on healthcare disparities, as well as training the next generation of physician scientists. And this is a major accomplishment for many, many people. And in particular, I want to again point out Tim Murphy, who has led this effort uh, really for the last 10 or 11 years. Next slide. And so our new uh, medical school building in the atrium now provides you know, a wonderful additional venue to allow collaboration between our basic science departments, which used to be six miles away on the South Campus, with most of our clinical departments that are either in the medical school building or uh, offices and research labs, and at least adjacent and attached buildings on the Buffalo Niagara Medical Campus. And so because of where we are, we were able to update a couple of years ago, a very comprehensive strategic plan for advancing our basic translational and clinical research missions. I'm just gonna keep this at a very high level. These are all on our website, but the current version has four goals and that is to conduct the best multidisciplinary research, both at the basic and the clinical science level. Uh, to quickly as we can translate those discoveries into clinical care that improves the health of our community and beyond. Importantly, create a research environment that supports and sustains excellence. And to increase the number of students and trainees, trainees who wish to pursue uh, a real career in biomedical research. Um, and, and the second part of our CTSA grant the KL2 Mentored Career Development Program uh, that Margarita Dvokovic leads um, is well situated to allow us to identify people who have an interest in these types of careers and really have a, a wonderful mentored program uh, to do everything we can to achieve success so that they can achieve the success um, that benefits us all. Uh, next, on a clinical side, um, uh, uh, that symphony has made uh, several steps forward. Uh, we're part of uh, a consortium called Great Lakes Health, which includes the university, Kaleida Health, and ECMC. Um, we also have, uh, very importantly, teaching services and faculty at the VA uh, at Roswell Park. Uh, we make use of the Catholic health system uh, we built Conventus as a true standalone multidisciplinary uh, uh, place for patient care, uh, ambulatory education, and outpatient research, um, and have over 60 additional UBMD outpatient clinics that we're trying to coordinate, uh, particularly with Kaleida Health, um, to uh, make this much more of an integrated system. Um, next slide. Very importantly at our major teaching hospitals is to have university leadership in leading roles on, on, on uh, clinical service lines or chiefs of service. And this is um, selfishly for the school uh, and also for the benefit of the hospitals to assure that that service line, in addition to being an excellent service line for whatever, neurology, pediatrics, uh, cardiology is in fact excellent for its inpatient and outpatient care, but also is a very uh, lucrative and, and welcoming service line that promotes education and also promotes new discovery and clinical research. And so we've been very fortunate at ECMC and at Kaleida uh, and at the VA uh, to have more and more of our full-time faculty shown here in blue have very real leadership roles in the major service lines that help assure uh, that those service lines do in fact create the three missions that an academic health center is supposed to achieve. Next. And so out of all of that about healthcare delivery, um, we recently updated our strategic plan for clinical care, uh, which is to develop uh, with our hospital partners a more and more integrated healthcare delivery system uh, to lead patient-centered quality-driven care throughout our community 
again, with a particular focus on health equity, to assure comprehensive quality healthcare services for all, to incorporate new knowledge that comes from our own discoveries as well as those from around the world uh, as quickly as we can into the delivery of our integrated healthcare system. And this also includes our other four health science schools. And to grow clinical volume and income to enhance the academic care system's financial sustainability, um, because in the end, it all costs money to do the many things that we are doing and we aspire to do in the future. Our educational programs are quite robust. Um, uh, we're one of the rare medical schools that, that has undergraduate bachelor degree majors. Um, we now have nine of those. Seven of those are directly within the school and are shown here with the newest one in red being the neuroscience program. The popularity of these seven programs continues to increase. Enrollment in each of these majors continues to go up and we're not cannibalizing each other as we bring in new opportunities for students to major and gain entry into any of our health science schools. We share uh, two additional bachelor degree programs, one in biomedical engineering with the School of Engineering and one broadly in bioinformatics with the college. We have several master and PhD programs and have added five of them in recent years. One in biomedical informatics and biomedical engineering at the master and PhD in addition to the bachelor level. A new one that John Tomaszewski has transformed anatomy into computational cell biology. A new one in genetics, genomics, and bioinformatics. And the most recent one led by Jennifer Surtees is recently we got uh, approval to have now a master's degree in medical genetic counseling, along with the other ones that have been traditionally here uh, uh, you know, uh, since before I arrived. We have our MD and MD PhD programs. Uh, we continue uh, to offer uh, fundamental knowledge in the biomedical sciences to other uh, health science schools for their professional students uh, in all uh, four additional health science schools. And we also have 67 uh, accredited graduate medical education programs. So our educational footprint is actually huge and, um, and then uh, uh, has continued to create and will continue to create the need to have an ever increasing number of faculty um, that wish to participate uh, in educating our students at the bachelor, the master, the PhD, and the professional level degrees. And it's not only the number of faculty and, and the, the increased number of programs that we have, there is a dramatic transformation going on in the venues in which that education is exchanged um, with our students. And I want to spend a couple moments on that because it's essential to how we take advantage of our medical alumni and our emeritus faculty. And it also creates a budgetary issue because we're gonna need more and more faculty to teach in multiple venues. And, and, and I can make that point visually in the next couple slides. So we built the new school to, to um, be able to accommodate uh, our increasing uh, number of educational programs and to also provide um, pretty interesting uh, venues other than the classic auditorium for exchanging information among ourselves and with our students. So next slide are just a few selected pictures of uh, our educational venues. So at the top, you know, we have the M&T conference room, which you know, sits 440 uh, people and you know, is used for, uh, for mass education of, of, of large number of individuals. Um, this is a very efficient way to educate because you can educate 440 people and tie up only one faculty member during the hour in which this lecture is occurring. But we actually use this venue and across the country, this kind of 
large conference room for education is used um, rarely um, and it's being replaced by small group discussions which include seven to eight students you know that are paired with one faculty person uh, and this is a photo of our active learning center so in the top i could educate 440 people with one professor at the bottom, I need 22 professors, one at each table, to drive and, 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 and help students learn um, in a different kind of venue of where it's active learning, students speak as much as the professor, um, and, and quite different than the traditional, you know, Butler Hall uh, uh, education that, that uh, most of us participated in in the South Campus. So we need more qualified faculty um, and uh, we have more and more venues of where small group learning, the active learning center being one. Next slide, please. This spills over into our Beeling Simulation Center, um, where again, we can simulate many, many different things. But again, it's small groups of students from all of our health sciences, but the need to have more and more faculty and one faculty is in this room talking about what happens if someone collapses on the street, you know, and in another room, it's a it's simulating a pediatric ICU with a team of physicians um, and students where I need more faculty um, uh, educating another small group of students. Next. We see this in uh, learning how to innovate. Uh, next. And in our surgical skill center, uh, again, there's 18 ORs up on the seventh floor. Um, and each of them requires a knowledgeable faculty person with a small group of students or residents or trainees um, that have to be present at the same time uh, to be able to achieve the academic uh, information exchange that we're trying to, uh, to, uh, to achieve. Next. So all of this has led to a, a very transformative educational strategic plan where we wanna prepare students to become exceptional clinicians. We wanna foster an environment that creates and supports outstanding educators. And we've created the Medical Education and Educational Research Institute under Jennifer Mecca with the acronym of MARY um, to actually be taught uh, to, to teach the educators um, about how to deliver uh, information in new venues and assess whether or not we're actually achieving our goal of advancing knowledge in our students. Goal three, to ensure that all medical students graduate with the expertise to analyze and integrate science uh, through advances in medicine. Increase the number of students who pursue careers as physician scientists which is a uh, uh, overlap with what was in the research strategic plan. And I think what has really become the most visible change is to instill a culture of professionalism, respect and commitment for our patients, for our learners and our peers. Um, and, and, and this is an area I'll come back to in just a couple minutes. Next slide. This is a draft. It's gonna go through lots of changes, but this is really the transformation of the four year medical school curriculum, which all of us participated in regardless of what medical school we went to. So for over a hundred years, it was two years of, of, of classroom preclinical work and two years of clinical work. And then over the last 20 years, a little bit of, of, of migration of clinical relevance into those basic science years um, and some exposure to patients, but still a pretty good firewall between preclinical and, and, and clinical rotations. We're now looking at transforming that entire four-year program where year one um, would have a series of integrated um, uh, 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 educational programs in all of the venues and even some additional ones that I've shown you in the last few slides. 
And we, they would be taking courses such as integrated foundational science courses. And at the same time in the afternoon, for example, start to understand foundations of patient-centered care, the importance of community learning, the importance of what is the health system, uh, what is science, what is social medicine, scientific literacy and discovery and learning communities, um, all done in these smaller active learning or simulated kinds of environments. Next slide. Year two uh, would continue that for the first six months. And then beginning in um, March of the second year, actually begin what we now do in the third year, which is the, the traditional clerkships. But before each clerkship begins, there would be reinforcement of basic science as it pertains to what really is important for a surgeon or an internist or in the, in the far right of the slide, a pediatrician to know, refresh students' memories about what and why we need to learn certain aspects of basic science, talk about the specialties that are in each of those areas and pull out some of the didactic lectures which can interfere with patient care the way we currently do it and pull those out into a special week long course of where there would be all of those didactic lectures occurring without the students actively taking care of patients at that point so that when they do take care of patients, their day is not uninterrupted by, oh, I can't see Mary because I have to go to a lecture. So this will begin in the second half of the second year. Next slide. It'll continue throughout the third year. And then in the uh, second part of the third year, begin to get into some of the electives. And in the fourth year, um, have that to be um, uh, more electives, uh, prepare students for interviewing, and importantly at the end, have special attention to preparing them for their transition from a fourth year student into a first year resident, which is a big step and, and a scary step as we all remember. Um, and so part of the new curriculum will be um, to help hold their hands and let them make that transition. Next slide. When our LCME came back for its usual eight year cycle and that site visit was two years ago, we made this slide, which again shows the traditional missions of education, research, um, clinical care, interprofessional education, but decided to put at the base of the pyramid, this issue of diversity um, and inclusion. And it really does drive everything that goes on uh, in the other missions of, of, of a standard medical school. So next slide. And this really came to light um, a little over a year ago. Um, and this followed uh, the murders of George Floyd, uh, 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 much more visible evidence uh, and groundswell for racism, uh, inclusion, professionalism, humanism. And so in June of 2020, a group of very thoughtful medical students wrote me a nine page resolution um, with very, very thoughtful uh, action items that they believed were important uh, to make the school stronger and to further convince me that we can't achieve excellence if we're not inclusive and diverse. So we took this nine page document very seriously and created a, a committee that has the acronym of DIAL. And if you could go to the next slide, Jennifer. I'm sorry, go back one, please. So this was a group of very, very thoughtful people. And we spent, um, well, we still meet, but we spent 
um, about 12 intense weeks um, thinking through um, these uh, resolution items that the students brought to our attention. And go to the next slide. And so in August, this is your rapid reading course, we ended up responding with a 26 page document addressing the issues that the medical students raised um, that, that, that were very important, very real, and that we committed to changing our environment um, and also got our teaching hospitals to be part of this so that we do have an integrated approach to make sure our learning environment, our educational environment, and our clinical care delivery environment are similar and respectful of the human beings that make up um, these uh, different entities. Next slide. So in October, because of this, we expanded our existing diversity strategic plan, which focused on climate and students and residents and faculty and staff and added two more if you push the advance button. One dealing with community and one dealing about how do we communicate all of the things that, that, that make up this utopic learning environment to the stakeholders that live in that environment. Next slide. And then we identified champions for the majority of the strategic plan items last January and February created smart planning templates with metrics for tracking. And if you advance it once, you know, it was important that people come up with uh, what is the tactic, what is measurable that you're gonna measure, is it achievable? what is its relevance, and what is the time duration of its life, so that we actually know what we expect and want to happen, and can actually then determine whether, in fact, it did happen. So again, a major transformational change in how we do strategic planning, inclusion of many, many more people into implementation of that strategic plan, and the next couple slides will just show you um, some of the early uh, positive outcomes of this. The students wanted to be more involved directly uh, in the environments uh, that, that they learn in. And so with our um, uh, development uh, group, so Eric and Jennifer and other people in our development office, began the process of uh, acted, actively soliciting funds that will go into an endowment that will allow each year, and we started this in June with the first, first cohort of eight students, and these include both our MD students and our PhD students. Each will be paid $3,500 stipend. They will commit 120 hours during the time that they're here and work with a mentor in a specific project in social justice and equity. Um, and uh, again, this process uh, started in June. We have our first eight fellows and the topics that they picked are, are very, very timely, very, very thoughtful. Um, and, uh, and, and I'm pleased and proud of what is a new program that involves our faculty and our students. Next slide. Dr. Love was the first African-American to graduate from our school, and he did so in 1880. So to honor Dr. Love, we created um, a new uh, Scholastic Leadership Award in his name, uh, and again, awarded the first recipients of this recognition uh, at graduation um, you know, a few months ago. Next. We've started looking at uh, our curriculum and all of our studies, both uh, at the graduate level and at the MD level. Uh, and again, the curriculum committee is looking at ways to start to put into those lectures important things about inclusion, diversity, racism, 
sexism, um, marginalization of certain groups uh, of, of people, whether they be patients and how we think about them or our peers. Next. And then have implemented and will continue to implement uh, in the departments, um, faculty training and development programs. And then again, through our CTSA grant and our KL2 program, um, uh, a very well thought out uh, information exchange programs um, to educate people uh, about the issues that are out there, unconscious bias, um, and the importance of having uh, an academic health center that has an environment that is respectful uh, and, uh, and, uh, and 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 um, positive about um, uh, how we interact with each other. So there are enormous, and, and then the other parts of it is we've had. Go ahead, you can just click on these rapidly. It just shows that throughout the past year we have had several really really outstanding uh, outside lecturers come uh, and talk to us quite frankly um, about health equity and social justice. So we have enormous progress to still achieve. Um, we have uh, uh, strategic plans in four major areas that are timely. Um, and, uh, and we have a growing integration with our hospital system um, to keep the next team busy for 15 or 20 years. Um, but I think by all of us working together, we've we're going to give the next vice president and dean um, a pretty good package um, to uh, continue to follow the trajectory that all of you have contributed to um, in our current school. And the last two things I want to talk about is again the importance of philanthropy and um, and in raising money. Um, as we've continued to uh, have much more of a diverse uh, uh, student population as we've increased the class size, um, as we have brought more underrepresented minorities into the school, um, it's clear that we need to continue to raise money to support scholarships. Um, and so uh, our development group um, has that as a co-priority in addition to the other reasons we raise money, which is to help build programs, uh, have endowed chairs and professorships, uh, attract uh, uh, better and better faculty and provide them with um, startup packages that they need to be successful. The other important competition for philanthropy and the, uh, the other important component about the budgetary um, issues that face the medical school and the new leader will need to address is we're still in the process of paying for this magnificent building. Um, but it comes with a level of stress. Um, so this is the uh, way that the medical school was financed. The medical school uh, cost $675 million. Um, the design was to pay $375 million in cash, and that was done. Uh, we have paid $375 million cash to the state of New York um, since um, about 2015 uh, uh, or 16. Um, we received from the state and SUNY 35 million new dollars. We were able to reappropriate $50 million that was sitting in UB to renovate Kerry, Farber, and Sherman and convince the governor to let us use that money instead toward new construction, and he approved that. Eric and Jennifer and others in our development successfully raised $50 million out of a $200 million campaign. But that first 50 was cash that was gonna to go toward paying the 375 million. 
And then the school was able to put together $25 million of reserves that we had that add up to the 375. The rest of the 675 was a mortgage through the state of New York, debt service through the selling of bonds. And so that amount was around 215 million. So the state sold bonds, but they did so over several years. And so the, um, the, the, the financial payment back for those bonds, um, which was the way that the only way the state would allow us to do it, results in a pretty high mortgage. So over 30 years, we will pay an additional $362 million. And that comes down to $12.4 million a year for 30 years. Um, there's a lot we could do with $12.4 million a year um, if we were not forced to actually pay for the school. So we as a state university are working constantly with the state to see if any favorable changes can come to the original finance package that the governor approved. But at the moment, we still owe 12.4 million a year. So when you look at the finances of the school, we have to pay for the building, we need to provide more scholarship money, and we have the opportunity to hire more and more gifted faculty um, and the support structure that they need and the maintenance of all of the things that we've just spoken about, that this becomes a fairly complex financial operation. Um, and this will fall on the shoulders of the new vice president and dean. Um, you know, we are in good shape, um, but there is a huge amount of effort ongoing to see if we had, can't have a more favorable outcome to how we pay this debt service. But I need your help. The next vice president and dean will also need your help, um, both in advice, in contributing to our educational mission, and to being a voice for the school, which you always have been, in helping to convince others to uh, give to the school um, so that we can continue to thrive. Um, it's been a pleasure to serve uh, in these roles. Um, and it has been uh, one of the best times of my life. And again, I want to thank this group for uh, being good friends and good supporters in every possible way. Thank you, indeed. If we could applaud, that was so extraordinary, Dr. Kane, and you made clear that your creativity and willingness to see a future which includes diversity and being aware of the social conscience <laughs> that is needed for positions of the future. Somebody is, should be muted. Dr. Katz, you're muted on accident. I think you muted yourself. Unmute. Dr. Katz, unmute. Time. I'm so sorry. I was saying how marvelous this presentation was. Thank you for that uh, message. This presentation was and showed the creativity of Dr. Kane looking toward the future of diversity, social justice, and creativity in so many other ways. We are so fortunate to have had Dr. Kane during these remarkable times of leadership. Replacing him is not going to be easy, that's for sure. Uh, at this point, we open the, for questions. And if you just raise your hand, I think Jennifer can help manage the questions. And I'm sure Dr. Kane would be happy to receive them. Is there anyone who would like to start? I'll start with one question, which I find intriguing, and that is, I know me many medical schools are increasing their class size. So we are seeing a, a kind of an extraordinary increase in the number of physicians that are being produced in this country. 
And I just wanted to get your sense of the need for numbers of new physicians as we go forward. Yes, yeah, so <laughs> it's very real. Um, there have been now several consistent surveys that people have confidence in um, are accurate um, in predicting what will be a, a, a continued physician shortage in the country, um, both in primary care, but now also in specialty care, um, you know, over the next 10 or 15 years. Um, so when I started here in 2006, there were about 125, 126 medical schools that were LCME approved in the continental United States, well, the, the 50 states. Um, there's now 150 um, medical schools. So there's been at least 25 new medical schools that have opened um, in the last 15 years to help with that physician shortage. Um, we've expanded 25%, as everyone knows, from 144 to 180 students. I think we're going to be locked into that 180 for a long time um, because, again, one has to, to expand. One has to have enough patients, enough faculty, enough facilities um, to make sure that every student gets the same experience. Um, and uh, so I think we've done that. Uh, a 25% increase is a, a hefty increase. Um, so I think we're going to hold at 180 for, I would think, at least another you know, 10 years. But, but we did our job. Um, uh, the other loophole is, not loophole, but the other constraint is the number of residency uh, slots that are still based on uh, a calculation done by the federal government on the U.S. population. And I think it was 1996. Um, uh, Senator Schumer, uh, with uh, help from people like Brian Higgins and others, um, have momentum uh, with uh, uh, a new uh, uh, law um, that uh, I think will get at least action as far as uh, a, a, a chance for the federal government to approve or disapprove. Um, that would, in fact, increase the number of residency slots paid by the U.S. government nationwide. Um, but that's the other thing that has to happen, because um, without increasing, increasing the students, without increasing the graduate medical education, um, doesn't solve the problem. But I'm optimistic that, that, that we will see favorable action. Thank, thank you very much. Yes, please, Gail, go right ahead. Unmute yourself and go okay. right ahead. Um, is there any possibility with respect to the med school debt for any of pandemic relief funds to be put that way? Um, we've tried, but the answer is no. Oh, sorry. So am I. Dr. Rosenthal? Yes, uh, Dr. Kane, uh, I think it's remarkable what you've done. I come from the social medicine side and I was sort of a part of the social medicine program at Montefiore Hospital 50 years ago in the development of this whole thing. In those days, the emphasis in diagnosis, which is the key, of course, to medicine and the uh, Larry Weed's medical, you know, uh, problem list, was the diet was was the uh, medical was the history getting a history of patients and the review of system which today seems to have been lost in medical care where you read the studies and I talk to patients where they hardly talk to people and they don't look at them much. It's always looking at the computer. What have you done in the medical school to bring back the concept of the history and the physical, the review of systems? Uh, it seems to be the, such an important part of medical care. Yeah, so uh, it, it, it still is. Um, and it is uh, stressed and it is um, one of the, those two areas are things that all students must successfully perform. Um, they actually have to have, uh, they have to keep a log um, of how many they've done and have they in fact been observed directly by a faculty person watching them uh, do a review of systems and do a physical examination. Um, so we're stressing it um, by uh, making sure that students 
um, uh, do do these things, uh, are observed doing them and are graded. And um, it's not just our initiative, it is a mandate of the accrediting bodies of US medical schools that have the acronym of LCME. But we have to report on a, on a regular basis. Um, and the answer that they want are that for each of your clerkships, 100% of the time, every student is in fact observed and critiqued about how they do um, their review of systems uh, and their physical exam. And then the other area where we stress that is in the Beeling Simulation Center. So those mannequins are hooked up to a human being a couple of rooms down uh, from where the mannequins are. Um, and so, uh, and that Beeling Simulation Center is uh, full of video cameras. So the faculty person can watch a student interview a mannequin <laughs> and the voice of the mannequin could be you, um, or it could be Len. And <laughs> Len could be in a very, very good mood that day and answer all the questions accurately and precisely. Or Len could be honorary that day and say, why are you asking me this question? I don't feel like oh, talking God. to you right now. Oh. Um, and then uh, the student learns how to deal with that it's all put on video. And then the faculty member with that student goes over the video uh, and the student receives you know, constructive feedback. Fantastic, thank you very Dr. much. Dr. Porosky had her hand up. <clears throat> uh, yes. uh, uh, Just one, wondering where is the school going to find all the faculty needed for this small group teaching? How are they gonna afford it? And what role do you see the emeritus faculty is playing here? Well, so we, we are continuing able to uh, recruit faculty, uh, Margaret, uh, as you know. So uh, uh, recruiting people to Buffalo is not a problem. Um, and we're bringing people from, from all over the country and the world. Uh, um, so so uh, bringing people or taking advantage of people that are here, and this is where our medical alum and our, our emeritus faculty can play a major role and we need you. Um, I think we'll be fine from the people power. Paying for it, um, uh, you know, comes from um, uh, primarily uh, uh, development um, and having a robust reserve <laughs> to um, help purchase a time from clinical faculty um, in seeing patients. Uh, and uh, we have started that by um, you know, having people who are academic scholars uh, paid primarily, if not totally through the practice plan, and then buying them out of um, you know, a half day a week or a day a week uh, for these um, you know, dedicated teaching endeavors. Um, but it's another reason to raise money through our philanthropy group. Dr. Brownie and then Dr. Walensky, I believe, followed by Dr. Cohen. Unmute, Dr. Brownie. Yeah. You have to unmute, Alistair, yeah. Yeah. Sorry about that. Anyway, Michael. I just said uh, that was great. I really enjoyed it. I, I've been here since 63, well, and I've seen a lot of deans. And um, there have been nobody actually communicated like you do. And what you did today needs to be broadcast to a whole lot of people. We had, just before you came, we had a arrhythmic administration, uh, but you, because of your background and your ideas, changed that, and thank goodness for it. I was particularly interested in the slides that you showed of curriculum, and I recognize that they're still being worked on, 
But I think you're on the right track. I think they are on the right, uh, right track. The, to get into integrated teaching as early as possible and not fill the time with lectures and lectures and lectures. So it's going to be tough for us. You have to realize that you're leaving us with this problem that we might not get someone who can with your skills, but we really need them. You set such a good standard, such a high standard. <laughs> um, we, we're going to have to look very careful at this search process. But thank you, Michael, very much. Thank you very much as well. But I, I, I am highly confident that um, uh, you know there will be very, very good candidates who apply for this position. We hope we do. We do hope so. Uh, Jennifer, did you say Michael Cohen was next? Michael, uh, Dr. Walensky and Dr. Cohen have questions if the dean has time for us. I know that we're we're getting close to one o'clock. So, um, Dr. Okay. Walensky. Dean Kane, need do to, we have you for a few minutes? Need to unmute. Uh, yes. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, Dr. Kane, for your your speech to us, it was extraordinarily informative. I just want you to know that the medical emeritus faculty has many members who could act as mentors at no cost to the medical school. It would all be pro bono service. No, and, th and that, uh, believe me, you will be called upon, um, you know, for, for the reasons that I mentioned. And I, I, you'll have fun doing it because, um, you know, we, we need uh, thoughtful people uh, to help run these small learning groups. And, and um, much of that is, um, is, is facilitating discussion. Um, and rather than one must go into it and speak. The, the faculty member should be the one who talks the least. Um, it is the students who uh, talk among themselves and, and our job is to insert um, correct information or additional information when needed, but also to guide them into, you haven't solved the problem yet, um, you know, keep working on this. Um, as I said, with the, the simulation, you can be a, a grumpy person, you can be a happy person, um, and, uh, and, and students need to know how to deal with both. Um, so I think there's lots of opportunities that are different than the traditional thing of which if you were a faculty person, it meant you had to put together an hour PowerPoint lecture and give it, um, or that you had to have an active clinical practice uh, and take on a student, you know, as as a uh, as a person who followed you around the the uh, the office. Uh, there's going to be many many more ways to interact in a helpful way, and, that, and that's actually quite quite good. That's marvelous to hear. And Howard, that was a, such an appropriate question that the emeritus faculty. I think we have. Uh, been thinking and offering to help, and we have been more and more, and we stand uh, we stand available. Jennifer, was there anyone else waiting to with a question? Did Michael, Michael Cohen have Michael? Did you have a question? I'm mute, Dr. Uh, Cohen. This may be our last our last question. I would think. Go ahead, Mike. I'm mute, Dr. Cohen. Okay. First of all, I wanted to uh, say congratulations to Dr. Kane. He has changed the culture of this school extraordinarily. And most of us are emeritus at this point in view. So how we got here is a little bit different from who's coming to the school currently. And I'm wondering uh, to ask the team, uh, what kind of individual are you looking for that you think ought to be trained as a physician in the kind of care that you're expecting them to give in the future. 
the medical distribution system is changing almost daily. I mean, we go from doctors to PAs to NPs to pharmacists, they're all in this distribution system. The kind of person that is going to be rendering medical care in the future will be much different, I think, than the ones that I went to school some 50 years ago. I wonder how, what your view of the incoming student ought to be. Yeah, so um, the, 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 the new students coming in are, uh, the one part that I didn't go into is our interprofessional education program. Um, and we're fortunate uh, at, uh, at, at UB to have you know, five official health science schools. And then we have openly adopted the School of Social Work as our sixth um, school uh, that participates equally in our interprofessional education programs. And it's going to be to convert interprofessional education to interprofessional clinical practice and we're working with development on a couple different sites that would be alpha test sites um, in, the, in, in our local community where one could have a team of healthcare providers, you know, that would include physicians, dentists, pharmacists, nurses, um, uh, 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 physical therapists, social workers, occupational therapists, um, and to really have team medicine of where each, each practices to the highest level of their um, of, of their specialty and and you know simple examples are uh, uh, I'm a cardiologist an electrophysiologist um, I prescribed uh, you know thousands of doses of antiarrhythmic drugs uh, during my lifetime um, and I would spend a lot of time. Uh, talking to a patient about the side effects of quinidine and amiodarone and flecainide, a pharmacist could even do it better than I do uh, and remembers, you know, can I take it with grapefruit juice? Do I take it on an empty <laughs> stomach? Um, and so we're cultivating that kind of learning environment. Um, but what's needed is places in Buffalo that, 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 that are um, examples of where that interprofessional clinical practice is actually occurring. So I think the new students are gonna to continue to, to be bright as ever. Um, they're gonna to have to be worldly as far as understanding that, that we're not excellent unless we understand diversity, that I'm sensitive to things I say and do uh, that I uh, uh, handle everybody with respect, um, and uh, and and I'm willing to, as an MD, and 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 you know, if, if I use that in an egocentric way, um, I may not be the sole commander of the ship. Um, it's going to be a team approach, and I'm going to have to admit. And I shouldn't have to admit because it's obvious when you do these interprofessional educational programs that I learn from what the social worker says uh, she or he would do when they see uh, a patient. So I don't know how much, with our IPE programs, it's pretty interesting. We have scenarios of where we have a patient in real life who has uh, these illnesses, these social issues, these economic issues, these family issues, either a family that ignores him or a wife or husband who's doting and won't let you feed yourself uh, because it's too stressful. And then um, having that patient uh, tell about himself or herself uh, or acting and saying they do this and then say, you're the social worker, how would you help this person? You're the dentist, how would you help this person? You're the physician. And it is amazing uh, that our students recognize they learn from their peers and have a different view of what total healthcare would look like if in fact it was team-based. 
Um, and that's where the country is moving. Well, thank you, Dr. Kane. And what a great topic to end up on. I think I speak for all of us here today that this was an extraordinary presentation. And we understand through your creativity, your willingness to, do, to adapt to new times and new needs, what we are facing with your departure. <laughs> so we wish you well, and we wish ourselves well that we can find someone anywhere close to what you have brought to us over these past 15 years. So thank you very, very much. <laughs> Well, thank you for uh, letting me spend an hour with you. And uh, as I said, I'll still be here full time and maybe two or three years I'll be joining this group. Um, but uh, I look forward to that. Uh, Bob, you know, Peggy and I are staying in Buffalo. We're Buffalonians. Um, and uh, so we'll continue to contribute every way that we can. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Have a good day. Bye.